All right, friends. So I want to welcome you to our 37th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This time is called Being the Church, and it is sponsored by ELCA's Coaching Ministry. I'm Jill Beverlin. I am the National Coordinator of Coaching for the ELCA and one of your facilitators today. It's important for us to be reminded that this time is meant to be a safe and brave space for the people of our church to bring the truth of who they are and how they are doing. These conversations are an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. I'm really glad you're here and we have a really fun topic today, improv and adaptive leadership. Some of you may remember experiencing improv from the old show Second City TV or our current Whose Line Is It Anyway? These shows represent the humorous side of improv, but those that know this skill also recognize there are many aspects of this approach that translate well to adaptive leadership. I wonder what improv stories you might have. At some point, we have all faced the unexpected. And surely, the year 2020 has brought this lesson straight to the forefront for each of us. Improvisation is an astonishingly, astonishingly effective tool for championing interpersonal communication, establishing connections, and developing meaningful relationships. These are all key ingredients in effective ministry. Today, we are blessed to have the Reverend Mike Weaver with us. In the winter of 2004, when Mike walked into his first improv class, everything shifted for him personally and professionally. Not only did he find his creative home, he began to see how the art of improvisation applied to pastoral leadership. Since that day, he made it his mission to connect the dots between improv and the church. Mike serves as pastor in the Southeastern Ohio Synod and is also their Synod Coach Coordinator. He is a professionally certified coach and has trained in improv with groups all across the country. Mike, we're thrilled to have you with us and look forward to learning more about the connection between improv and our work in the church. Welcome to our space. Thank you very much, Jill. It's so I'm so happy to be here. It's great to, uh, man, this is awesome. I, I love this topic and I love being here with all of you. And I see some familiar faces and a lot of faces I don't know, some names. And regardless, we're here together. And that's what's important about this space. So happy about that. So I just want to begin just to get us, um, I want to share a prayer actually by Thomas Merton, one of my favorite um, uh leaders across church history. And uh, before that, I want to share a verse or two from Luke, just to get us centered a little bit. And it's Luke chapter 10, when Jesus sends out the 72. And as I think about these verses, it reminds me of how at the heart of God is, is, is improv. And uh, he invites us into improv. So Luke 10, uh, he, it says, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that house. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And very, very briefly, here's that's an imp, it's an improv exercise for the disciples. And and, and everything we're going to talk about today, we, we could I could talk I could talk for a week on this topic. Um, but we're going to capitalize it in, in a half hour. And this experience with the disciples, the 72, and for the 12 before that, is an exercise in improv because they're entering uncertainty. They're lambs among wolves. They feel they, they don't have anything. Don't take anything with you. And improvisers, you step on stage and you don't have anything except each other. And, they, and Jesus sent them out two by two. You have each other. And that's all you need right now. And step into that moment. Go into these houses and stay. He doesn't even give a give a, a length of time. Just stay until you until you leave. 
And you don't know when it's going to end until it ends. And that's improv too. We don't know when a story and improv is going to end. It ends when it's supposed to end. And we kind of, you kind of get it. As you do it more and more, the practice of the art of improv, you kind of understand what that means. But Jesus, at the heart of Jesus, is improv. And then he invites his disciples like you and I and leaders like you and I into these uncertain places where, where all we have is each other, something deep in our heart, and our relationship with Christ who sends us out. And that's enough. So let me pray this prayer, um, share this prayer and pray it with us from Thomas Merton. I called it, and he didn't call it this, but this is my, my title for this prayer, a prayer for times of uncertainty. It's this, let us pray. My Lord and God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, although I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. So, improv. Um, basically, so here's the thing. Let me just set the context for us right now and, and just name where we are as, a, uh, as leaders in an uncertain time. Uh, that we that continues right we're continuing down that road but for many many years leader So is Mike putting us on the spot? Like Jill, do you want to improv? <laughs> right? <laughs> Great so, example. Yeah. Did I just freeze up? Yeah. Start again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. My connection is, I just get this little, talking about the unexpected. Thank you, Jill, for that question, because that was just an unexpected. We're going to roll it. So there is the thing. Your, your connection is unstable. So VUCA. VUCA means volatile, uncertain, chaotic and ambiguous. And for 20 years, um, leaders have said, this 21st century is a VUCA time. And these last eight months have been a VUCA time. Uh, and VUCA is not the best place. It's, it's, it's an, it's a, it is where we are, but it's a hard place to lead in that place where everything's volatile and ambiguous and uncertain and chaotic. So how does a person lead well in that? Well, I first learned that phrase from my friends in the Applied Improvisa Improvisation Network. And that's a global network of leaders around, literally around, as I said, globally, that works with business leaders. I work with church leaders and other leaders literally around the globe to help leaders lead well and adaptively within a VUCA context. Uh, because while we might say globally we are in a VUCA place, we also know as improvisers, an improv stage is a mini VUCA place. Because as we don't, there's no, there's no script. It's completely uncertain how it's going to go. You kind of hope it goes well. Um, it's, there's a chaotic na nature to it because you're writing the script as you go. And it's ambiguous. You, there's a lot of just like, well, how's it? And a lot of negotiation between improvisers, how that story is going to be told. Uh, so it's very applicable to improv, but also to leaders as well. And we've, you know, eight months into this pandemic, uh, I, I mean, I'm not the first person to say it's been, um, we've faced complaints and frustrations from people in the church and outside the church. Um, some, it's difficult to make 
uh, long-term plans where we're, we shrink life down to day by day or week by week. Um, right now, as people, as churches, I know our church is doing budgeting. So how, what does budgeting look like? Talk about ambiguous and uncertain and like, what, how's this all going to work out? How, what's what 2021 looks like? We don't know. And so we're all in that imp like shrinking everything down to that day, that week, and maybe the month. We don't know. And so that is in, in, in leaders I know that I've worked with and I know for myself, it's tiring and it's uh, to face budget shortfalls and disappointments and sadness. It's tiring. In most places, you develop resilience. And I think the best place I have learned about resilience is improv on the improv stage. Because I said, it's a VUCA place, like leadership's a VUCA place. And we have to respond within that place. Improvisers have to respond unless silence is part of the story. If silence is, is emerging because we're scared, the story falls apart and we stop. But as improvisers, so I'm just speaking for myself, as improvisers, just... I have to step onto a stage and work with other people and listen and connect and respond moment to moment to moment to moment. And when we start stringing these moments together, connected to one another, we create strength with each other and courage and confidence to continue forward in the uncertain place, in the amb ambiguity, because all we have is each other and our listening skills in that place. And when we do that, and I've done it myself as a performer, but also I've taught it to lots of improvisers. When that happens, magic happens, quote unquote magic. That is a story emerges. When, that, when people stop listening and get too far ahead, the story falls apart. It happens 100% of the time. Or if you have three people on stage and one person decides they're going to be the center of attention, the story falls apart. Because the improvisers are not, they're not to be the center of attention. The improvisers are there to serve each other. And when they serve each other, they're serving the greater story. And if somebody tries to take over, because nobody knows what the other person's thinking, so you have to stay hyper aware with each other. So I'm saying all that, and I think, how uh, not that true for the church? Isn't that true for leadership? That if we're in this VUCA place, that it behooves us to be very hyper aware of, of each other and listening and connecting because the story of the gospel is still being told and it's being contextualized in the context we serve. But if we get too far ahead, we it's going to continue, but it's going to be harder. But if we stay connected, we can tell the story contextually another moment and another day and another day in a very meaningful way that becomes very authentic to the ministry of the places we're called. So... So improvisers do three things, and it's true for leaders too. We stay centered in the ambiguity, in the uncertainty. There just has to be a place of centeredness. There's a great, there's a great um, uh, game I play with improvisers a lot, and I wish I could play it here, but we can't on Zoom. If we were together in physical space, I would play this game in a minute. It's this. And I, I encourage you to play this with your friends, okay? You get a group of people together and you create category. You're going to get three categories. One is you might say, give us um, categories of cars. And each person thinks of a, ca a car. And then I pass my car, Toyota, to that person. That person I just pointed to passes it to another car, uh, uh, a Honda. And we basically have categories, but eventually we're taking these, we have one category, then a second category with a different pattern and a third category with a different pattern on top of that. And it's completely chaos, but you're trying to keep the patterns going at the patterns you established. 
And the only way to get through that game is by completely like centering in that moment. And your mind has to be incredibly calm. Because if you get lost in everything else, you're, you, you'll get lost. But if leaders, we can stay very centered in Christ, things start to emerge. We start seeing the next moment emerging. Confidence, centeredness, and staying connected. So let me tell you my quick story uh, of improv in my life. So I was, uh, in 2004, as, as Jill said, I, uh, I'd been a pastor for six years at that point. And I'd gone to a ice cream store uh, in Columbus, Grater's Ice Cream, one of the best ice cream uh, in, in all of the United States. And uh, so I walked in and to my left on this bulletin board for community events, there was a picture, it was a, it was a flyer and it said, um, improv for professionals. And I said to myself, I know what improv is. I've never done it. I've seen it on TV. I'm a professional. I think I can do that. And so I signed up for a class for six, uh, six classes. And that, as I said, that, that's, that first class, I felt at home in a moment. I realized I've been doing improv all my life. I realized I've been doing improv for six years as a pastor as well. And certainly it was designed to say, think on your feet, learn the skills about thinking on your feet as, as a professional, to think creatively outside the box as a professional. And yet it was much more than that, than improv class. And so I stepped into the uncertain moment of knowing these people, but then I got connected with these improvisers. And we became like a family that eventually formed a troupe that has been, been around for the last 17 years called Easily Amused Improv. Now, improv is not about comedy. It's about connecting. Improv is about connecting. Improv can be dramatic. It can be incredibly tear jerk, a lot of tear, uh, a lot of tears. It can be draw the, the audience in like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. Like the best drama would do. Or it can be incredibly funny. I've seen it all. I've been part of those things because we don't know what the story is gonna be until we start telling it moment to moment to moment to get moment together. Connecting with each other, each moment, each body movement each word that's shared. And ministry is like that too. If we reduce ministry to just one tiny little thing, we're missing it. Ministry is so complex and so broad, but what the common denominator for ministry is, it's about connecting. And out of those connections, something else emerges. The story emerges. Now, my friend William Hall says this, we don't know what we're going to do, but we know who we're doing it with. Invest in those relationships. Now he tells that to executives that he works with, high level executives of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and, he, and he's an, William Hall is an applied improviser as well. That's how we know him. And he said, that's what happens on stage, but that's how it happens in leadership too. So my challenge for the synod I serve as a coaching coordinator, I put out a challenge to our pastors to say, and for me as well, we don't know where we're, where we're going as a church right now in 2020. We don't know. But we do know who we're with. So let's, who are the key relationships right now in your leadership that needs investing in? And people need to be seen. So if some of you have your cameras on, I just want to pause for a second and do this. Would you do me a favor and see people on the screen? I mean, take them in for a moment. See their eyes. See their facial expressions. Just see them. Look around the screen and just take them in for a moment. See them. That stuff matters. And that's the beginning of improv. One of the best improvisers I've ever had a, a privilege of training with is Gary uh, Schwartz, who lives in Washington State. Gary Schwartz was an apprentice to Viola Spolin. Viola Spolin, um, her son started... Um, uh, I think Second City, Chicago, I think. 
Viola Spolin was, was a long time improv teacher. She wrote a bunch of books about it. One of her first exercises to every beginning improviser, in, whether they're kids or adults before she died, and Gary continued it forward, was see people. See and be seen. Art, the, the art, like whether it be painting, photography, any art form begins with seeing. If we can't see, quote, if we can't, we can't take things in, we're not, we can't go anywhere. So everything that Luke said, or Jesus sent out two, two by two, they had to see each other and walk together. They had to see the people they're entering their houses with. They had to see them and take them in and appreciate them and just, just draw them together. Because when we see and we're drawn to each other, things emerge from that point. So see each other and start investing in those relationships. So I encourage you today to think about who are the one, two, or three key relationships as a pastor you have right now that need to be seen and invested in. And these are your storytelling partners that you're improvising with, whether they know it or not, you, they, you, you know that. Let me tell you, so when, when I first met my wife, I, I've been married eight years and I was, I hadn't dated for a long time and um, here's what happened. I was incredibly nervous before I met her. I met her online, I met her, she lived in Columbus, I lived in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I never met in person. And I was incredibly nervous and I didn't know what to do. And I thought, let's just meet for coffee. And she thought, we're gonna meet for coffee for a date? I want that, I didn't know, I was a pastor, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm trying to funnel my way forward through this. But here's how I got over my nerves. I said, Mike, what do you know? I know, I know improv. I'm going to approach this conversation as an improvised conversation, which it is. Because I don't know what she's going to say. She doesn't know what I'm going to say. We're writing the conversation script as we go. So we talked for an hour. And it was an incredible conversation. She didn't know I was an improviser. I didn't tell her that. She didn't know I was improvising. I didn't tell her that till later. But I knew that. And that made all the difference because what it did was it brought me into the present moment. It got me out of myself, got me out of my fear, got me out of my, my stuff and brought me into courage and confidence and brought me into one of my favorite rules for improv, make the other person look good. I'm my job as an improviser, my job in that moment with my first date with my wife was to make her look good. Because here's what I know about dates for men, for example, in those moments, for, for me was, I'd heard this from other people, like women would say, gosh, he just talks about himself the entire time. I don't wanna do that. I wanna switch the script. That is, I'm gonna make her look good because she as, is such a valuable person. And if, we, if it never went anywhere, I made a friend. Right? And that's how I, I let go of the outcomes. Just forget the outcomes. Let it go. Be in the moment with each other. And eventually something else happened, a second date. I didn't know if that was going to happen. But we can all do that. We can all do that. Be incredibly present. Put down the phone. Get our heads in the same space that our feet are. And be incredibly hyper aware of the person we're with. And we see them. We take them in. And we respond honestly, and we make them look good. Because listening is a skill that makes the other person look good. Because when you really listen to somebody, they feel incredibly valued. Even if you incredibly disagree with them, disagreement is immaterial at this point. It doesn't matter. I might disagree all day, but if I value them as a person, this, there is a beauty of grace that happens in that moment. And we all know that. We've all experienced those things. It's now putting that together even more, like consistently on a daily basis, on a moment to basis. And I literally have strived to, and I'm, I'm not perfect at this by any stretch of the imagination, 
But daily, I think about these things. How do I approach this day as an improviser? How do I approach this moment? How do I approach this coaching client I'm with? Every coaching conversation is an improvised scene for me. And I'm there to listen deeply to that person and respond honestly to that and not pre-plan questions. I can't pre-plan questions because I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what they're going to say until they say it. And I can't think of a question until they say it, whatever that was, right? So it's all improvised. And we don't know when it's going to end until it ends. We finally figure it out when it's going to end. It happens all the time. And it takes confidence to enter that uncertain moment where we don't know when it's going to end or what it's going to be or how it's going to turn out. The outcome will be it will be whatever it's meant to be. And that's improv. Um, let's see. Let me think about what else here. I'd also say this. Look around this, uh, these tiles here, these, these faces, your names and your faces, who you are. I ask you to see people. Now I ask you to look around See them, but don't see them. See, but don't see. It's almost like you're looking through them to their, the wall behind them or to the background behind them. You know, what they, you know what I'm saying? See them, but don't see them. And now see them. Look around and see that person. See their faces. See their, their eyes. And now don't see them. Don't see them. See them, but don't see them. And now see them. Too much of our lives is seeing, but not seeing. Too much of ministry on Sunday, if we're gathering in person right now or not, whatever it is, especially if it was in person, we're so busy and we see people, but don't see them. And you and I have felt that place where we were seen but not seen. It doesn't feel good. But if we're seen, and improv and that's an improv game that Viola Spolin said, that see, but also see, but don't see. She goes, because improvisers on stage can see, but don't see because they're in their heads. They think they know what the story's gonna be. They know what the next moment's gonna be and they get too far ahead and the story falls apart. All the time. 100% of the time, without exception. But if you can slow yourself down and see and, and, and aim at making the other person look good by seeing them, by listening to them, things, magic starts happening. Magic starts happening. Okay, so that's improv in a nutshell. Boy, I could go on forever about this, but we can't. But you're going to talk about it in your in small groups. Jason has got it, everybody in small groups, right, Jason? Yeah. And there's questions you have. There's actually a couple games. One is a pet peeve game. And I give that to you because I just want you to be honest for a minute, one minute at a time. And the, the, um, the, uh, the description will be in the chat. All right? Thanks, everybody. Hey, Marcus, can you hear me if you're able to unmute? Hmm. That's weird. I can't even, on my screen, I see his name. Oh, did he leave? I put him in the waiting room. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah I just, it, it's... 
So we have about 30 seconds before the rooms close totally. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Judy, were you saying something to ask because you were muted? Hang on, still muted. I just see your mouth moving. She may be All on right. a phone call. Oh, there Did we are. This better? Okay, sorry. What was the last question that you had? Something about us writing down two of our favorite things, but pairing off. I asked you to repost it, but you didn't see it. So we got oh. a little lost in that, but what okay. were we supposed to do? No worries. I think Mike will cover that and we okay. are all back. Okay. Hey, bro. okay, so um, basically the, the, that last thing is, I, it was, it was, I'm improvising my way through that question for this group. Cause I never done that, that game on a zoom. So I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but if we had, if we were in together, you basically pair up and you have two people and each person has say something. One person says, my favorite thing is chocolate. And the other person says, my favorite thing is roller coasters. Okay. Well, if you smash these two together, it's like kind of like the old commercial. Remember that commercial of Reese's peanut butter cups. Mm -hmm. You put your chocolate in my peanut butter, my peanut butter, my chocolate. Two great tastes, taste great together. Reese's peanut butter cup, right? That's what this game is. It's I, I call it Reese's peanut butter cup game. Basically, you're taking two different things that don't belong together, chocolate and roller coasters. So what if you create something brand new that's never been before? What could that be? So it's a game of accepting each other's idea, even if I don't like either one of those ideas. And then together cooperating to make something brand new. And you're basically honoring each other, seeing each other, valuing each other, and moving that forward one moment, one, the next moment. Does that make sense? That's what that game is. So, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know if it would work. Now, the pet peeve game, by the way, I told our group, the pet peeve, I, don't, I hope you guys did it. Um, what I love about that is um, it's honest. It's real. It's down to earth. And did you notice that, at least for our group, I'd tell you what I noticed, that na laughter emerged naturally. Because nobody was trying to be funny, but everybody was trying to be honest. And out of the honesty and truthfulness of the pet peeve, we connected to it and we laughed. And that's the principle for improv. The truth is funny. Trying to be funny is not funny. Inauthenticity is not funny. Authenticity is what we connect to. And so as pastors, we connect with people authentically and sometimes it shows up in preaching and other places, right? I mean, that's what we do. Um, but that's the power of that game, pet peeve, monologues. Other questions or any thoughts um, anyone, uh, anybody has? Mike, I have a question. This is Carol oh, Schultz okay. in San Diego. Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, how do you improvise with someone who lacks integrity? Ah, that's a good question. A very good question. Um, I, it does, it does, it's a tough place to be if, because I'm not sure what the integrity is, the issue is with the integrity. But just on a basic level, I mean, it, it, just saying, you know, their actions and their words are are inconsistent. They they say one thing and do the other. Right, that's a tough place because it's because it's like you don't know what to connect to, mm -hmm. and so the improv is only only shrunk down to in a very meaningful way. I see you, and that's about. I mean, because it's hard to build on something if it's so inconsistent all the time. Yeah, it's hard to go anywhere. Uh, it's kind of why they, there's a thing called um, yes, but. It's tough to create something when there's always yes, buts. Yes, it's kind of an acceptance, but we really don't want to do that. Well, then and, you can't do anything with that. Yeah, and the one thing I know about improv or that I've been told about it is that it builds on yes and. Exactly, that's right. Yep, and if a person lacking integrity, you really can't have yes and very well. Yeah, that's, that's you yeah, and that's a situation that I'm finding myself in, so. Yeah, and then it's, then it's finding the people that you can build with, Yeah. right? And so maybe this is not the best improv partner, quote unquote, improv partner. And there's other people around that can that kind of get the yes and without explaining it too much, right? Because they just kind of get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. 
Anybody else? Questions? It's been really fun to be with you all. Hope this has been helpful. And uh, I uh, hope it's really helpful. What? How much time we have left? We, we good? Good. Uh, let me share this brief blessing. Is that, can I do that before we go? All right. From St. Teresa Avila. St. Teresa of Avila. She said, let nothing disturb thee. Nothing affright thee. All things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance attaineth to all things. Who God possesses in nothing is wanting. Alone God suffices. Amen. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your talent, your wisdom, and who you are with us, the truth of what God has shown you. Um, I know for myself, I invited people in the chat area to share um, some of the themes that bubbled up for them and what they're still wondering about and what they're walking away with today. And I know that for me, my phrase that I'm walking away with, Mike, that you taught me is connect with the people around me serve them and have that goal of making them look good. <laughs> and in that connecting and deep listening, which is one of our primary skills as coaches, right? Um, that happens, we honor those people and, and they feel valued. So thank you. Friends, we, as always, appreciate you being with us. I'm taking the time to look at each of your faces as I'm saying this and, and not looking through you, but seeing you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the, the work you are doing in God's kingdom. Um, it has eternal significance. Never doubt that. Please join us again next week. We will be meeting with Rachel Alley again and um, our work on growing young and everything that that means, not just chronologically young. And um, Tammy and I will stay on for an extra 30 minutes for those that desire additional conversation. And God bless you. God bless. Thanks, Jill.